This is Dr. Cave live from San Francisco to talk about your request for what happens to your body when you're getting ketamine. So thanks to everyone who filled out that poll so that I can give you the content that you want to learn about so that you can better advocate for your health and better take control over all those secrets that you can control in your body. They're probably more than you've ever been told. I first want to start off by reminding everyone that ketamine is used in four places, in the street, in the emergency room, in the operating room, and yes, for depression, anxiety, chronic pain, PTSD, and other conditions that are ultimately a result of cognitive rigidity or in part due to cognitive rigidity. And we're going to talk specifically about what the effects of ketamine are on your body when you're getting depression, but you need to know that there's a dose dependence for all of these effects that we're going to talk about involving your eyes, salivation, your brain, heart, lungs, etc. And so Sheila's asking where the uh, poll was. It's on the, uh, by the way, on the posts, I post lots of fun stuff, <laughs> lots of fun photos of mochi and karma and all those polls so that I can learn what you guys want to learn more about so I can tailor my content for you so you can better advocate for yourself. Like I said, that's the goal of, of everything that I share with you. It's not medical advice. It's for you to advocate for yourself because no one can do a good a job as you in our unfortunately broken healthcare system. So let's start with ketamine and the eyes. You have to know that ketamine is kind of a derivative of another medication or, or another substance called fencyclidine or PCP or angel dust. And one of the hallmarks of PCP intoxication was nystagmus, meaning that your eyes are kind of fluttering. Nystagmus is typically an involuntary thing, though there is one really fascinating case report, you can look it up on YouTube, of a woman, this is fascinating, she learned how to cause nystagmus in herself as a coping mechanism to overcome anxiety. She would literally blur what she's seeing so that what the, the environment she was in wouldn't affect her anxiety, cause her to have, I don't know specifically if there were PTSD-like symptoms or whatnot, but the idea was that this fluttering eye movement was a characteristic of PCP and ketamine is in some ways a derivative of PCP. And in some cases you can actually have this weird wobbly movement. It, when you're having ketamine for depression at those doses, typically the nystagmus is not seen. That being said, at higher doses, like we have in the operating room, there's something we call ketamine eyes. It's a little bit um, unusual. Other anesthetics don't have this, but their eyes are kind of all over the place. It's it's an unusual experience. Now in the operating room or the emergency room, you're often getting other medications at the same time. So you don't remember this weird stuff going on with your eyes. But if you used ketamine on the street and you're in the ER, one of the things that we might look for is what your eyes are doing. That might be a clue about what um, overdose you had. Those are the eyes. I see, by the way, lots of great comments here from Jamaica. Um, and photo can asking if ketamine can be used to treat ongoing tension headaches. It's uh, a possibility depending on what the source of the tension headaches are. Uh, like I've talked about in other videos, ketamine can address things where cognitive rigidity is the underlying or a major contributor. Often tension headaches can result from perseveration and rumination that are leading to anxiety or depression or being stuck in habit loops that cause us to be... Uh, if you will, stressed out, activating all these muscles and the traps, the back of the skull, et cetera. So in some cases, if it can address the underlying cause, photo can, yes. Now let's move on to the lungs. What happens to your lungs when you're getting ketamine? This is actually very important because when you're in the operating room, we have to use one of these special properties of ketamine as a bronchodilator. It causes the airways to the lungs to expand. Furthermore, it doesn't depress your respiratory drive. So your lungs are still moving on their own volition controlled by your brain, unlike propofol or opioids like fentanyl, morphine, et cetera. So it's very powerful when we are having sedation um, <clears throat> in the operating room or the emergency room. Now, if you're using ketamine on the street, you can stop overdose, but you're going to still probably be breathing unless you have too high of a dose. The... Uh, bronchodilation is what we actually use for asthma attacks if someone's having um, an acute bronchoconstriction episode, either from pain, from secretions, if they're sick for emergency surgery, like an upper respiratory illness. So it's a property of ketamine used in those areas and 
the ketamine clinic for depression, for PTSD, like um, I see some others asking here, at those doses, you don't necessarily need to worry. If you're having an asthma attack, right, it'll help. It's not going to have any adverse effects for the average patient at the average dose used in ketamine clinics. So that's the lungs. But I'm mentioning that it is very useful for asthma attacks, especially if a patient's having sedation. Without a breathing tube, I will give a little bit of ketamine in those cases because it can be a powerful antidote to bronchoconstriction, which can be life-threatening. Now, salivation, this is a weird one. This is a weird one that nobody really talks about unless you're an anesthesiologist because at high enough doses, ketamine makes us juicy. <laughs> what does this mean? Literally, it makes us juicy. When you get enough ketamine, it actually increases salivary production, but not only the saliva in your mouth, but other parts of your body as well, including down there. I'm not even kidding. I, I don't personally know what receptors it's activating <laughs> to do this, but it is such a problematic effect in certain high dose settings, not necessarily in a ketamine clinic. However, it can be an issue there. I've definitely had some patients that uh, have a lot of, I just see them swallowing nonstop because they're producing so much saliva, not typically seen at those doses, but in the operating room, it's such a problem that we have to give anticholinergics to purposely dry out the mouth so that we can do our procedures in, in particular, bronchoscopy, because if we're trying to put a breathing tube in a, a patient who's still awake or breathing on their own, who has ketamine on board, they're going to be so juicy that we actually won't be able to see what we're doing. So salivary production goes up with ketamine. And like I said, it can be problematic. So glycopyrrolate, we will use regularly in the operating room. I don't typically use glycopyrrolate for someone who's having ketamine in my clinic because those doses simply don't warrant it. Um, and Mel is actually bringing up a very good point. Many SSRIs can cause dry mouth. This is because many um, antidepressants, SSRIs less so than TCAs, have anticholinergic properties as well. And one of them is going to be that dry mouth. So we give certain anticholinergics on purpose to counteract ketamine's effects. But many medications, unfortunately, and this is a huge reason why I use medications when needed, but I always caution patients to be aware of side effects because you don't just get dry mouth from anticholinergics like Mel was saying. You also get dizziness, fall risks, potentially constipation or nausea. And this is in addition to the REM sleep disruption that we know SSRIs and SNRIs, and for that matter, THC and alcohol can contribute to. And if I want someone to have a healing journey with ketamine, I want their dreams to be intact. Because they can always, and this is a whole different topic that I discussed in other videos, but we want that dream. In some cases, dreams can be therapeutic. If we can use them in a way that's not a nightmare way, like when patients come to me with PTSD, but be able to use those experiences also as healing psychedelic experiences, access, accessible to us every night we're sleeping potentially. Like I said, a whole different fascinating discussion that in the Western biomedical model, we don't give much validation to unless they cause nightmares. And it's, I, I don't mean to change it here, but just recognize how problematic this is that in the West, once again, Western medicine, hey, I'm allopathic trained, Stanford, Harvard trained, I'm not anti-allopathic medicine, but recognize the shortcoming where if it's a problem with nightmares, then we try to give medications to wipe your memories overnight and to mess up your dream formation. But we don't look at the other side of the coin. How, how can dreams be therapeutic? You know, it's unfortunately a common recurrent theme we see in Western medicine that we need to know when to put the brakes on and reconsider when I'm evaluating a patient. Now, uh, the heart, I gotta talk about the heart as well in ketamine. So when you're using ketamine on the street, at those doses, you're at risk for myocardial infarction, AKA heart attacks, arrhythmias. In the emergency room, those doses can also cause elevations in blood pressure, heart rate. And the operating room, and yes, even a ketamine clinic when you're getting an infusion. So you need to have blood pressure monitoring, absolutely. And you need to have somebody who knows how to treat something that happens. Because when used at moderate, low, moderate, and even high doses for short periods of time, it increases your sympathetic drive, ketamine does. Now, over time, if you're very sick, if you're having surgery, for example, and you've been cachectic, meaning like you're just weakened from cancer, or you've had lots of stress coming, physical stress, and you've depleted what we call your catecholamine stores, ketamine can actually decrease blood pressure. 
So when used acutely, it increases. When used, when a patient's already exhausted all of their adrenergic store, if you will, for lack of a better term, you don't have that catecholamine surge that you can tap into. So you actually uncover the cardiodepressant effects of ketamine. This is, and like I said, in sick patients, you don't really see this unless you're in a, maybe an ICU setting or someone coming in for repeat surgeries. For, <laughs> unfortunately, the street, OR, ER, ketamine clinic are going to have these elevations. And this can be problematic because it can lead to strokes in addition to the heart attacks, in addition to arrhythmias. It can trigger AFib. It can trigger VTAC in the wrong patient. So you got to be careful. You have to know what you're using, what you're doing, pardon. And this is why if you're having a ketamine infusion, you always want to have a physician who is trained in how to use IV ketamine, how to counteract what's going on with your heart should something untoward happen, in addition to the psychological training. Now, before I tell you a little bit more about ketamine, I need to back up and say that all of the, these benefits of ketamine that I'm telling you about are one that used in the right environment. And I can't stress this enough because like any medication, heck, we give you rat poison when you have heart problems, right? Coumadin is a rat poison that we, use, we used to use more. Now that we have newer medications, we use less of it. But in atrial fibrillation, we got to thin your blood. So we're giving a poison in the right setting. It can be life-saving to help prevent strokes from atrial fibrillation, but it's still a poison. It has to be in the right context. Ketamine has to be in the right context. And whether you're getting IV or an, a pill form, these side effect profiles are a little bit different what I'm telling you about. But you know that my point is that when you, I have someone who's struggling, where they've been stuck for years, I don't want to go with a, a, a pill that may or may not give them a response in three, four, five, six weeks from now. I want to use an IV infusion. And unfortunately, in medicine, we have this term called bring out the big guns. And they, you know, in the hospital, they say, oh, give them the big guns, give them the most powerful antibiotics, IV, give them the most powerful cardiac meds, IV, the big guns. This is like a war type of <laughs> terminology. And I don't want people to come into a ketamine infusion clinic or ketamine healing journey thinking about, oh, ketamine's a big gun. Rather, I want you to view this as it being a personalized approach. That is what makes it powerful. The IV lets you dial in the exact dose that you need. There is no one size fits all. Just think of your SSRIs. Hey, ask yourself, why are there so many SSRIs? Why are there so many SNRIs? Why are there so many medications with depression and anxiety? It's because they don't all work. I mean, it'd be perfectly clear. Maybe 25% of patients will achieve a substantial significant benefit that's clinically meaningful. We don't know a priori, who those 25% are, yet we give them to everybody. This is a very crude approach. Of course, it's appropriate in the right setting. If it's the only medication we may have access to, and there aren't other psychosocial ways to address the root cause of depression or anxiety. But if you're coming for ketamine, please remember that it's not about big guns. It's about personalized approach. And when you have the doctor that you trust, with IV ketamine, and we can specifically give you the dose that you need, guide you along the journey. That's what makes this a powerful medication, not because it's a big gun. <laughs> Don't think of it as a warfare. That's kind of counterproductive. In medicine, we do this a lot, unfortunately, in the Western mod uh, model. It's always a battle. It's a struggle. You know, it's bringing out the weapon arsenal, what medications to give. It's um, very warlike, and it's not always conducive. Keep, just keep that in mind. Now, I need to ask, answer a couple of your questions here. Uh, as well. Oh, and we'll talk about the brain after I answer some of your questions because ketamine's effect in the brain are what we're all here to talk about. Um, Tori's asking, or some people are asking about PTSD and ketamine. Yes, preliminary evidence, absolutely for that. Once again, has to be done in the right setting, not being stuffed in a room with an IV and expecting your PTSD to get better in six sessions. This is a joke. This is a waste of time and money. I have a whole video on ketamine scams. Please watch that because I don't want you to fall into one of these traps, expensive traps, set up expectations that are going to hurt you up in the wrong, hurt you in the long run. It's painful. It's not right. Um, Linda, what if you get approved for nasal spray? Nasal sprays of ketamine have um, on the lower end of these side effects. You can still have the heart rate, blood pressure changes we talked about, but you recognize that the nasal spray only has two doses. So when we're talking about IV, you can have anything from zero to 100. For a nasal spray, you have two doses. As you can imagine, very limited applicability. It's more accessible, certainly, but it's just not as 
tailored, personalized, or individualized. And by the way, if you guys appreciate me coming on here, <laughs> just a quick shout out. I'd appreciate it if you hit that like button or share what you learned with others so that you can help with your new knowledge, help others who are struggling with physical or mental or psychological pain and learning what ketamine does to your body and how you might be able to discuss it with your doctor to feel empowered to advocate for yourself. So your support help, uh, helps me do this more often. It means a lot for me so I can help you. You know, I don't like to do ads or product placement because I don't believe that those are always helping advocate patients in the right way, the way that this knowledge will. Um, Sherry um, is talking about rat poison for epilepsy. Yes, many anti-epileptics anti are a form of poison to the brain. As are anesthetics, by the way, when used in the wrong setting, absolutely, we know that anesthetics are solvents. Ether <laughs> is a, um, literally, it's like a pain thinner. We don't know, I mean, we know the effects in the brain for brief surgical operations are, is not significant, but over time, we don't know. These gases are very fat soluble. Literally, they're paint thinners. You know, they, your brain is made out of fat-like substances. So uh, everything is a poison at the wrong dose. Absolutely. Um, Ragdoll of Sin was giving ketamine in the ER and it helped calm them down. And... I certainly hope that if you pursue ketamine in the future, you have the right mindset around it because the ER mindset is not always the most conducive to those benefits that we'll talk about next for the brain. Uh, oh, but let me say, this is a great question here by Linda. Do you stay with your patients when you give them a ketamine infusion? Yes. It's very important to make sure that you are not abandoning a patient who is trusting their heart, their consciousness, their mind, their body to you during the psychedelic journey. Yeah, there's sometimes when we may briefly step out of the room, but we're monitoring them still. And always there's immediate accessibility to the physician, the guide, so that the safety risk, both psychological and bodily risk, are not ever an issue. It's very important to make sure that you're gonna be with somebody pretty much the whole time. Very good. Now, the brain, what happened? What does ketamine do to the brain? A lot of people, telling me that, oh, ketamine's a disassociative anesthetic. And that's totally true. Hey, I mean, patients come to me every day, totally. <laughs> disassociative anesthetic. Just the other day, I had someone who was trying to tell me, lecture me on it. And it's true. What does that mean? Guys, what does disassociative anesthetic mean? Because to me, it means nothing. And I've been using this thing for years. And it, I don't understand. I, I don't know what that means in the context of somebody who's struggling to overcome PTSD, treatment-resistant depression, etc. So... Let me put it to you this way. Ketamine gives us an opportunity to change our perspective of self. Maybe by disassociation, some patients resonate with the concept of it separating us from our perceived sense of self. Call it our ego, call it our identity, call it the cognitive rigidities that underlie our inwardly focused loops of, in, of perseveration and rumination that ultimately facilitate persistent changes in self-representation. Persistent changes in self-representation is the cornerstone to long-term healing with ketamine or with other psychedelics. But this can't be achieved by just taking a pill and expecting things to get better. And I have so many patients that come to me with this expectation from other clinics that didn't bother to tell them that, hey, this takes responsibility and accountability on both of our parts. So as part of antagonizing the NMDA receptor and modulating glutamate levels, ketamine affects our sensory inputs. There's this thing in the brain called the thalamus. Some people call it the gatekeeper of the body senses. And that's kind of true because when things go from your spinal cord, things that you touch, feel, etc., cetera, they, they reach your brain so you can perceive this by going through your thalamus. Ketamine affects various receptors in the thalamic region of the brain. And it modulates them in ways that we can't always predict, but you know, it's not necessarily that you see things that aren't there necessarily, though that can happen, but maybe things that are there begin to change, like the walls are waving or your room is moving around you. So ketamine is changing the sensory inputs going through your thalamus, et cetera, to your brain, which gives it some of its trippy characteristics, but we can also use to help change our relationship with the world around us when guided properly, the right intentionality setting, et cetera. And there are a couple other side effects. Nausea is a big one. Uh, we usually pre-treat with something. I don't, 
nausea is not just from the ketamine. It's also from this whole experience. So I can't say it's exclusively, you know, I don't take, I don't like to give extra medications if I don't need to. And the majority of patients are not nauseous from ketamine infusions in my clinic, nor in the emergency room, nor in the operating room. But because nausea is a multifactorial type phenomena, it certainly can arise when we're talking about stuff like this, or someone's getting ketamine in the greater context of a healing journey. Um, and also, I mentioned earlier the breathing pattern. Breathing patterns, you know, the brain and the spinal cord, of course, govern your automatic breathing. And ketamine does not affect those the way that opioids or propofol does. So it's pretty cool that the effects in the brain are relatively safe from that perspective. Like you're not going to overdose and die from hypoxia. Of course, you can overdose like with anything. And one quick side note, because people um, always tell me about marijuana and overdosing, just because we're talking about overdosing here. And it bothers me to no end how naive this concept is that you can't overdose on marijuana. And it's like, you're not going to overdose in the sense of fentanyl overdose and stop breathing, but you come to the ER one day and see what people come like, what, how people come in completely intoxicated in the sense that you're just not with it. Family members are worried about them. They don't know how many edibles they took by accident. Grandma took a, an edible by accident. The baby accidentally put something in their mouth and now they're completely uptunded or they're just like, you know, nauseous, vomiting, et cetera. So overdose is a very lax term that unfortunately you have, you have to know this so that you are empowered, right? Don't let people tell you, oh, this is safe. You can't overdose on it. It's nonsense. The wrong dose, anything can hurt you. Maybe not kill you outright immediately the way that opioids can or propofol can or ketamine can, but they can certainly cause life-threatening scenarios. And when used over time, can cause changes to the brain and body that can be absolutely distressing and potentially life-threatening. So this is, um, it bothers me because it's just taking advantage of naivety. And people think, think something is all of, all of a sudden safe. Nothing is safe at the wrong dose. Nothing nor for the extended periods of time that people use these substances. So uh, let's get some, some more of your questions answered. And once again, I'd appreciate it if you um, do hit that like button and share what you learned with others to help educate your friends and loved ones so that you can help them with this knowledge. Uh, Alex Cole says, a week post-op, surgery went well, struggled a lot with pain for about five days. I hope that your pain is better under control now. And it's fascinating how ketamine, since we're talking about it, can also affect chronic pain, not just from the NMDA receptor antagonism. And this is a whole other discussion of uh, central sensitization, wind-up phenomena. Ketamine is fascinating. We don't quite know how it works so well, but we have some ideas. We'll talk about those in a different video about how we can hit the break button via its neuroplasticity on this concept of the body keeping score from painful or noxious experiences or stimuli like surgery, things like, like tissue destruction, we can prevent it from causing these changes to the body that increase our pain in the future. Like I said, spinal cord sensitization, wind-up phenomena, these might be involved in fibromyalgia and other pain conditions. Um, we talked about tension headaches. Rapid eye movement, it is used in some therapies. I forget what it's called. Michelle, maybe you're referring to EMDR. Um, ketamine, I'm not aware of ever being used purposely for its nystagmus effects because it's not as reliable as PCP was. And you don't want to use PCP. That is not a safe drug to use. No, no, no. Um, Justin Hogue, why don't hospitals use ketamine for severe pain treatment? They do. They do. After surgery, many hospitals have low-dose ketamine infusions for post-surgical pain. Maybe not for GI problems like gastroparesis because it probably will not help with the underlying cause of that. Um, Michelle's talking about Botox for tension headaches. Yes, that is one treatment. But do remember that Botox causes muscle atrophy in the long run. You don't want to be using Botox for long periods of time because when you paralyze muscles, which is what Botox does, you know that's exactly what it does, you cause the muscle to not be used. When you don't use muscles, they atrophy. And now a couple months later, you're going to have to rebuild that muscle again. So in the right setting, it can be very helpful, but you don't want to overuse Botox. Very good point. Um, pickles. 
Is there a certain thing ketamine regulates, such as being a glutamate receptor modulator, or does it regulate a number of receptors? Uh, pickles, great question. Ketamine is a very dirty drug, and it modulates so many receptors that we don't even know yet, much like other anesthetics that we use, because ultimately they're meant to render someone unconscious. You need to affect lots of receptors. It's not just one, as far as we know. Um, at least with the exception of propofol, I'll say. So yes, ketamine affects many receptors. I have a couple of videos on this actually showing in the operating room how these different anesthetics work. You can check that out. Uh, blessings to you. Good to see you on here and learning about ketamine for the first time. And these side effects, Heidi, are typically, I go, I won't go through the different, whether it's ER, OR, or ketamine infusion or at the street, um, but typically they're dose dependent. When you're in the OR or the ER, these side effects increase with that dose. All right. Uh, severe complex PTSD, says Ragdollison, to the point I actually woke up not even two hours of, of night terrors. Uh, I'm sorry that you had that, Ragdollison. And that's every time we relive here, this will maybe end with this because this is powerful here. Every time we relive a traumatic memory, we are accessing a memory. And it's affecting our body. And actually, you know, I connected myself to the monitors just the other day in the operating room. So you could see, we talked about ET, a video that I really, a movie I really don't like. You saw my heart rate response, right? The more we access the memory, relive it, we strengthen a connection between that memory and physical symptoms of PTSD, at least at a superficial level. There's more to it, but we'll start with that. Now, when you give ketamine, you are changing the relationship between that accessed memory and that physiological response. Not unlike what we do for beta blocker therapy with propranolol, a lipid soluble beta blocker, where you give the, the, the propranolol and you, access, you ask them to access the memory, but you blunted what their body can do in terms of heart rate, blood pressure response. So now you've disconnected these two nerve um, neural processes. We believe that helps lead to fear extinction is what we call it, or to help mitigate what that PTSD memory is doing to facilitate it being consolidated like a normal memory. Ketamine can do the same thing, we believe, by virtue of this BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic growth factor, growth factor, as we believe, once again, this is hand wave, but we never really know, but this fertilizer for the brain, allowing neurogenesis to help allow new connections to be formed when that traumatic memory is brought up compared to the normal physiologic response that PTSD would ordinarily um, arise or uh, elicit. Hope that answers your question. Oh, Alex, thank you for the um, <laughs> that super thanks. I appreciate it. Um, we run out of time for today, but remember that you have more power over your health than you've ever been told. And if you want to hear more, uh, if you have more questions, check out the polls. Tell me what you want to learn about, and I'll share with you from the perspective of the operating room and the unconscious human body, when it opens up like a book in that privileged ketamine clinic or operating room environment, I will share with you the secrets that we don't know about how we can take over that, our health in ways that probably more than what we can do at the doctor's office, at least in most, not all cases. Now, please, I know some people are going to say, oh, my mindset fixed my broken bones, doctor. That's <laughs> not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the majority of chronic conditions that people are suffering from. So those jokes... Joke's on you, I think, because that's not the reality of most patients that come to me. It's not from these things that surgery is going to fix, that a medication is going to magically fix. The fix comes from within us. And this helps you learn how you can uncover your inner healing potential. Thank you, everyone who came on. See you on the polls. Until next time.